thank you so much for joining us. It is a real pleasure and an honour to talk to you. Thank you. Honour to be with you as well. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about the book, The Light We Carry. Now, it offers kind of strategies about how to cope with life and the things you've learnt along the way. One of the themes you discuss is kindness. So I'd really like to know, how have you been kind to yourself today? Well, oh, thank you for asking. As uh, I, I point out in the book, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I am still a work in progress and facing myself each morning with something kind is still a challenge. Um, but I try every day to do as I say in the book, um, greet myself with a positive message. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really uh, a shame that so many of us, particularly women, that we have a hard time just sort of looking at our own image and not tearing it apart and figuring out what's wrong. Um, but I think that that's at the core of some of our unease and unhappiness, because if we don't start out by learning to love ourselves as we are, it's hard to, to pass that on to, to others. Um, so I, I am working on it every single day. So what was the thing you said today that was kind to yourself? What have I said? I, I've said, I love the jacket I'm wearing. I'm with you. I started there. I like what I'm wearing today. I think I look cute. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges um, you refer to when you talk about fear, you say the most anxious I've ever been in my life was when Barack Obama told me for the first time that he wanted to run for president of the United States. And it's strange that I could have altered the course of history with my fear. You know, you could have said no. You know you had that option and it would have stood. Mm. Are you pleased you said yes? I am, I, I, I am. I, I think, you know, to take a moment to talk about the man that I love, I think that Barack was a um, consequential leader. Um, I think, you know, for so many young people, not just here in America, but around the world, they grew up knowing only a black president, a, an African-American family in the White House. They saw themselves in the one, one of the most powerful positions on earth. Um, if you just count that alone, not to mention all of his accomplishments uh, from a policy perspective, it was absolutely worth taking that leap of faith. Um, but that's why I share that story. Um, I want people to sit with how fear can catch us up because I had to work through what was keeping, what, was, what would have kept me from saying yes. And what it was, was me not wanting to change, not wanting to change my life, going to a new city, doing something I didn't know, making new friends, trying something hard. Um, I didn't wanna share that, that, that type of doubt with my girls. I had to think about the story I wanted them to tell about our family, and I didn't want to be at the core of it and have them say, my father could have been president of the United States, but we didn't do it because my mother was afraid. I didn't want to tell that story. I lived through the legacy of too many people, particularly African-American people, my grandfathers included, whose lives were constricted by their fear of, of something different. You talk about visibility, and you talk about the importance of being seen and about many minority groups, which are not seen still. And you say we need to stay aware of whose stories are being told and whose are being erased. Who at this moment in time do you think isn't being seen? I, you know, the, the irony is, is I think there are more and more people who feel like they don't matter on this planet, you know, and, and I, I talk about what it feels like to be different. You know, I, I, I open up the book by talking about difference and how it, de it, it defines so much about how we see one another and how we see the world. But you'll notice that I also define difference very broadly. It is not just race and gender, but it's, it's, it's economic status. It's whether you live in the city or in, on a farm, it's how you learn, how you love, how you feel. There's so many of us who feel marginalized. And that's a curious thing 
that we, you know, because, you know, we live in such a complicated planet that so many of us don't feel seen. Um, I'm trying to express my view of what differentness feels like, um, but I think that, uh, that that's where the work happens. We cannot wait for other people to see us because some of the people that we think see us feel marginalized themselves. They don't feel seen or heard. So we have to start from within. You know, I, I start the, the first question you asked about starting kind is like, if, if I'm waiting for somebody else to tell me that I matter, that I look good, that I'm okay, I could be waiting a long time, not because they don't believe it, but they're, but they're focused on their survival. They're focused on their own personal journey. Uh, we can't wait around for one another to see us. The, fir the work we have to do first is seeing ourselves. That message of positivity was one that you and your husband, Barack, took on the campaign trail. Kindness, being seen, people counting. What have you taken from the fact that the US electorate decided to replace Barack Obama with Donald Trump? In the book, you say, it still hurts. Mm -hmm. Does it? It And it still hurts. Um, but that's that point in time when you have to ask yourself, was it worth it? Um, did we make a dent? Um, did it matter? Uh, and when I'm in my darkest moment, right, my most irrational place, I could say, well, maybe not. Maybe we weren't good enough. Um, but then I look around and I, I you know, when, when there is more clarity, when I'm able to unpack those feelings and think more rationally, I think, well, my gosh, as I said earlier today, there are, there's a whole world of young people who are thinking differently about themselves because uh, of, of the work that we've done. Um, and that's where, you, you know, you can't allow great to be the enemy of the good. You know, did everything get fixed in the eight years that we were there? Absolutely not. That's not how change happens. But we laid a marker in the sand. We pushed the wheel forward a bit. But progress isn't about a steady climb upward. There are ups and downs and stagnation. That's the, the nature of change. Yet yeah, the world we're in today, here in the UK and in the United States, has become more and more polarized, particularly when it comes to politics. People seem divided, they seem angry. What, in your opinion, is needed to bring people back together, to let them have pleasant discourse, agreeable disagreements on a middle ground? Well, leadership matters. The voices at the top matter. Um, if, if we continue to be susceptible to voices that want to lead by fear and division, we will follow suit. Um, that's why government matters, democracy matters, voting matters. Um, uh, so I think it starts with having leadership that reflects the direction that we want to go in as a people. I love the fact that you say when you entered, we needed a pencil box for Sasha, a ball gown for me, a toothbrush holder, and an economic rescue package. I mean, there was a whole load of stuff going on alongside a life you wanted to make normal. And you talk about how you had to protect your daughters, Malia and Sasha, more than ever before, and help them live with a small level of normality. Did you succeed, do you think? You know, I, I'd like to say that now that they are young women in the world, they're becoming who they're going to be. I am so proud of the, the, the individuals that they've become. Um, and yes, we fought to make their lives normal in a very abnormal situation. And we did that by just pushing them towards normalcy, really just systematically making sure that they didn't connect their lives to what we were doing. That meant that, you know, they had to go to school when it was time to go to school, making sure they could drive a car and knew how to make their beds and, you know, were on teams and uh, participated in soccer matches. And that meant that we had to normalize ourselves as parents in the community so that us showing up for a parent-teacher night or a soccer game wasn't a big to-do. Um, 
So it, it was a, a, a mighty bit of work uh, keeping our kids on a normal track. Um, but I can say what helped a lot was having Marion Robinson, grandmother in chief, uh, on our side through the process. <laughs> you have met Nelson Mandela, Maya Angelou, great people. Who had the biggest impact on you? Oh, well, see, this is the interesting about, thing about role models, is that the truth is, is that the, the people, just despite the world leaders, the amazing, courageous people that I've come in contact with, that contact was only momentary. The people that impact me most are the people that are in my life every single day, my mother, my father, my working class parents are the people that laid the foundation because they were the first people to see my light, to hear my voice, to give me the space to believe that I was enough. And I, I share that only because so often young people, parents without resources think that in order to have an impact on a child or on the planet, that you have to be a Nelson Mandela. You have to be grand, rich, you have to have legacy. And what I've learned through my upbringing is that being present, greeting your children with gladness, being there for them as an advocate, a day-to-day -day constant, doesn't require money, wealth, privilege, position, but it matters the most. All parents have that tool. Everyone can be a mentor. Um, it, it, you, you don't have to be a world leader to have an impact. One of the sweetest stories is when you had a, a classroom of young children <laughs> and you said, ask me anything you like. Mm. And one of them popped up a hand and just said, can I have a hug? Yeah. Secret to a good hug, according to Michelle Obama. <laughs> you gotta mean it. People know the difference. You know, they, they know when you're embracing them for show and when you're embracing them because you see them. So I think the key is don't hug unless you mean it because people will know the difference. <laughs> Uh, Michelle Obama, it is time for your quick fire round. Oh my These God. These are very oh easy God. questions, but they're to be answered. Quick, quick, on quick. On the hoof, okay? Which question do you detest being asked? Uh, are you gonna run for president? Okay, answer? I detest it. No, I'm not, I'm not going to run. <laughs> um, how is your husband Barack's golf and why don't you play more? Oh, um, you know, Brock would say his game is uh, uh, frustratingly average for the amount that he plays. Um, why don't I play? Uh, because I'd rather play tennis. <laughs> you mentioned your wonderful mother who stayed at the White House for eight years alongside you to help raise the family. Um, so you spent all that time together. Have you finally usurped your brother Craig as her favorite child? No. <laughs> I don't think I've surpassed that goal. He's, he's still pretty cute and he's still her only son. I'm still working on it though. <laughs> and Sasha and Malia uh, made you and Barack a not so great, a week I think you describe it, martini when they first welcomed you to their home. Can either of them now make a decent one? I hope not. I hope they're not getting a lot of practice at martini making, but you know, we'll, I, the next time we're over there, we'll have to test it out. <laughs> Knowing there was a huge reaction when you broke protocol, when you hugged the queen, when you visited the UK, um, would you hug the king given a chance? I would, uh, I would take his lead. I would stand down until I was touched or hugged. I've learned that protocol. <laughs> you are 30 years married. Congratulations, Thank I believe you, you celebrated Thank in October. Yay for us. In one word, the secret not to staying together because lives are separate and they come back. The secret to coming back together. Love. Let me say this, like is even more important than love. Like, that's my word. <laughs> And finally, the most important and politically astute question you will be asked in your lifetime. Toilet roll. Your parents fought over whether the toilet roll should go over or under the toilet roll holder. Your mother stood down to go under. Give us an insight in the Obama household, over or under. 
I do reveal this in the book. You know, if I wanted to leave a cliffhanger, I would tell people to buy the book to find out, but I won't be so cruel. We are an over family. <laughs> Michelle Obama, Mrs. Obama, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much for so your much. time with us.